Hi, everybody, and welcome to this evening's um, LSE event um, celebrating Pride, the behavioral science behind the inclusive social movement. I am Grace Lorden. I am an associate professor in behavioral science here at the London School of Economics. I'm also the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative, who are hosting the event tonight. And I'm also the author of Think Big, which is my book in the back, which is really colorful. Um, and that's the only self-promotion that you're going to hear from me tonight, because I'm really excited to spend 90 minutes talking to a fantastic panel. So we're very lucky at the LSC. We usually get experts to come and talk to us about subject matter. And tonight, that's no exception. But I think to say, you know, I've spent some time in the green room and I've spent some other time with people on the call tonight, and they really are just all amazing, friendly, fantastic people. So I think this is going to be not just an intelligent discussion, but also a very, very fun one. I'm going to start by introducing um, Antonia Belcher, who is the founder of the MHBC Coming Construction Consulting. Um, she has just sold that, but has 40 years experience in construction and property in the property industry. Transitioning in 2000 and 2003 in a male dominated working environment where there was no history or visible LGBT plus influences to draw on. She presses for positive change for LGBT plus in all business spheres, but especially in construction and surveying. She's been recognized for all the great work that she does with numerous accolades. So for example, she's been recognized on numerous occasions as one of the Financial Times top 100 LGBT plus executives. So welcome Antonia, very nice to see you tonight. Um, and then Arlene, Arlene McDermott is the Head of Business Management Group Legal and Compliance at the London Stock Exchange Group, or LSEG. Um, she also co-chairs the LGBT plus network LSEG Pride, and that network has won a number of accolades for the fantastic work that it's done. But Arlene as an individual also has numerous accolades, so she has been listed on the Pride Power List 2020 and 2021. Global Diversity List 2020 and Visible Lesbian 100 List 2020 and 2021 and the Outstanding 100 LGBT Plus Executives List 2020. So welcome Arlene. Um, next to Belton Flournay, who's with us tonight, and he is suffering from COVID, so I'm really glad that you could actually be here Belton, so I'm glad you're getting well. Um, he is the founder of Portivities UK's LGBT plus group, where he is also a director. Um, this network also has done some fantastic work and has been shortlisted by the Inclusive Tech Alliance Network in 2019 in recognition of that. Um, as an individual, he's also a superstar, so he's been shortlisted by the British LGBT plus awards, received numerous and other honours, including being listed as in the top 20 of Yahoo's Finance top 100 future leaders. Belton was the co-founder of Pride in the City, and more recently he now sits on the Inclusion Initiative Advisory Board at the London School of Economics, which is really lucky for me. So good to see you here tonight, Belton. Um, and a familiar face to most households, uh, Jane. Welcome, Jane Hill. Um, is a BBC journalist and presenter. She presents the BBC um, News at One and uh, lots of other BBC news programmes. Um, outside being a journalist uh, and news presenter, Jane is proud to work with diversity role models and the Albert Kennedy Trust. Jane is a champion and a mentor to members of all minority groups, and she also is an advocate and supporter of health charities that are very close to our heart, including Parkinson's UK, Breast Cancer Now and Cancer Research UK. Welcome. Welcome to the virtual LSE, Jane. And last but definitely not least, um, Pip Spunts, uh, Director of Credit Suisse and Head of Global Markets Technology Strategic Programs. Pips is the co-chair of the firm's EMEA LGBT plus ally network. She is proud and out member of the trans community um, and identifies as both gender fluid and non-binary. Pips is a true champion in progressing LGBTQI plus inclusion and equality and has been recognized as such. For example, Pips has won the Inspirational Leader category as part of the British LGBT Plus Awards. Pips also carries out work with other key organizations, um, including having presented at Parliament, working in the Government's Equalities Office, the United Nations, and many others. Um, welcome, Pips. And I have to say, you are a joy to see in my inbox. I, 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 I'm not a big emailer, but every time I get an email from you, it really makes, it really makes me happy. So with all of that stuff, you managed to send the best emails. Um, but welcome. I, so I really want to hear from you tonight. Um, this is a celebration of pride um, as an idea, as an ethos, as a, as a social movement. And I really wanted to get the kind of thoughts that you had about the mechanisms that have provoked the most behavior change in your particular sector. So everyone here is different in that they're from a different, uh, different sector. We have construction, we have banking, we have data, we have the creatives, we have consulting. Um, so if I come to you, Jane, thinking of your sector, what do you think have been the biggest levers to promote biggest change when it comes to inclusion? It is about 
um, visibility and awareness, I think, isn't it? I mean, and I'm sure that's true for all sectors. Um, that it's something that Pride does, and it's something that all of us as a community getting together, talking, sharing our stories. I just think that's so, so important because, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to look backwards too much, but we all know about the struggles and, and how far the LGBTQ plus community has come. But I would say, let's keep looking forwards. And I think more than ever, it's still important to remind society that there is still a long way to go. I mean, there is way more acceptance and freedoms as I hope perhaps all of us on this panel perhaps represent um, than there was when I was struggling to come out in my 30s, um, than lots of lots of people have, have struggled in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, but, um, but there is still so, so, so much more to do. There is still so much that is not right. Um, and events like Pride and, and lots of other organizations and charities and, and, and organizations that we're all involved with and know about. Um, it's about flying the flag. Um, <laughs> no pun intended, no, no pride flag, but just, just generally re reminding people of our community and our stories and how while great progress has been made, um, there is there is still so much to be done and obviously I sit here I mean I can't I can't um, sit here and speak for the entire media sector uh, nor would I be allowed to um, and my experiences and my knowledge is as people perhaps know is very BBC and within that very BBC news and that might be something that we'll get onto over the course of the evening as as we hear some really interesting stories from people representing all the other sectors because people think the BBC it's one massive ginormous organization and it's one amorphous sort of lump and I think what's quite interesting is even within my own corporation which is perhaps the best part of 20,000 employees uh, I think there are even some bits of the BBC that uh, have taken on board LGBT plus stories very well and portray the community. Um, there's always more we could like to see, but um, but do do their best to try to portray gay stories and remind people uh, that, that gay and lesbian and, and trans people are part of everyday life in this country. Um, but there are, but the BBC is not, uh, shock horror, the BBC is not one big amorphous group. And actually there are other areas of the Beeb, and I would argue particularly the one I work in, in news, um, that's perhaps still got um, a, a little bit further to go. Um, and uh, I won't say too more on that at this point, but but that might come out in terms of what you do and, and your area. You know, you're trying to drive organizational change, remind organizations why it's so important to have diverse members of staff, diverse groups of staff, um, because in our case, that makes better programs. You know, I want to make better programs for everyone. Everybody pays the license fee in this country. So I want TV programs, radio programs, online content that reflects and represents the remarkable cross-section that makes up this country in 2021. Uh, so so that, that's my, my standpoint. So it's about awareness and visibility. I'll probably stop there because um, other people will be able to feed into that in a, a far more articulate way and about um, a cross-section of industries too, which is important. And what you say, Jane, rings true with, with, with our work at the Inclusion Initiative, the idea of these kind of microcultures within organisations, and it's the people within those teams, those kind of smaller units that determine the culture for individuals, not the industry as a whole. So yes, uh, Antonia, for construction, it, it, you know, it, it's, a it's a male dominated industry. If we think about kind of change that has happened in the sectors, what have been the big levers that have allowed progress to be made? I, th I think um, what Pride does is it amplifies those stories, which um, in my sector were very few and far between. Um, but there's been massive improvement in the sh in the short term. In, you know, it's not unusual now um, within construction and property um, to to see a Balfour BT JCB in a in a Pride march uh, in a decked out in the rainbow flag. Um, with actually Balfour BT con construction workers 
uh, walking in the in the, in the in Pride um, with their rainbow rainbow laces and their high vis rainbow vests, and I think that's amazing. I mean, it, it's wonderful that that we've got that contribution. I mean, those people may well have been part of Pride many years ago, but probably can clandestinely because you know a construction company would not have wanted to see its 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 members of staff doing that sort of thing. So the fact that that businesses within construction and property want to support these things I think is fabulous and uh, you know for me one of my my own little stories that happened this year in June when when Pride would have been happening was I'm a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors who have got these rather grandiose offices in Parliament Square they look out onto the Houses of Parliament and um, this year they flew the Progress Rainbow flag for the first time ever which obviously uses the trans flag colours as a part of the flag and they sent me an email um, at the time, and it just basically said, Antonio, we've listened to you. You challenged this to fly a trans flag or trans colors three or four years ago when we, when we were first putting the rainbow, rainbow flag up. And here it is, you know, we've done it. And, and, you know, we are here to make sure that members of the profession are not discriminated against, that policies that discriminate against them are not gonna be allowed by us, we will fight them. And I thought it was really good that you know, I, I I got that from them. They even in a you know a period of pandemic when basically the RICS had furloughed most of its staff, it had shut down. There was still someone someone there that was thinking of it this year and wanted to do something about it, and they flew the flag. So it's a small thing. It it it, it um it's, but but it's an example of of what we do if we're out there saying that you know we need to change and we use the the um our, our stories uh, our role model whatever you want to call it um uh, actions um and we use them within our profession within our businesses to achieve that aim um i think the only thing i would say is 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 about the commercialization and people will challenge businesses like balfour bt um, and some of the big construction engineering practices jumping on the parade on the pride bandwagon. I think in their defense, I would say that, you know, for me, it's brilliant that there's millions of people wanting to do pride um, and hopefully we will get back to doing it. And I think it's brilliant that the Barclays Bank float floats in the parade because it, it, it shows that all that hard work and all those brave people who walked in the 60s and 70s down Piccadilly when people were shouting at them and probably doing worse, it wasn't, it wasn't a waste. It's, it's, it's allowed us to do what we're doing now and allow the message that people like the panel are, are giving out there to be spread. And so, so that's, so yeah, I can, I can see some criticism behind it, but I think, you know, we have to appreciate that it's a good thing. I always remember that someone on the radio saying, you know, the M25 is a good thing because it gets people to get around London. You know, most of us will criticize the M25 when we're stuck in traffic, but you know, there we go. And I think the thing you describe, Antonio, is so important for younger people who might be thinking about coming out and might be thinking about being their authentic selves, to see the floats, to see the laces, to see the other signals that make the visibility of pride is such an important part in the, in the movement. Um, for people who are listening, do ask questions, do feel free to upvote them. We will come to them in about 30, 30 40 minutes or so. So do become part of the discussion. Um, Arlene, you're in data tech, again, another male dominated industry, um, you know, te technology is, is, is known for its lack of progression at times, but I hear fantastic things about LSEG. So I'm wondering what were the big levers that allowed you prompt change within LSEG and within the industry? Thanks. And thanks for asking me to be here. It's uh, pretty humbling to be on such an amazing panel. Um, so, you know, I always say, Whenever I think about pride and when people ask about pride and why do we do it, the usual kind of questions, you know, I always I always remind people that pride was a was a riot. It wasn't a party, you know, and um, and that it is, you know, it is the case that for many people in this country and absolutely across the world where being part of our community leads to persecution, leads to pretty horrific things happening to people. So why do we, so, so there, therefore, you know, why then are we, are we surprised that 35% of LGBTQ plus people are not out in the workplace? You know, why are we surprised then that 62% of graduates go back in the closet when they arrive in the workplace, having been out at university? 
So that's, you know, and, and, and pride is, is for me another platform, and I talk about this a lot, it's another platform for our allies, for our company, to shout the support that they have for our community. Because if we don't know, we don't know. If I walk into an organization and I don't know if it's okay to be out and nobody tells me, it's safer to assume it's not okay. So that's what pride is. So every pride, every year, well, for the past few years, I cover my office in Rainbow Place. I enlist some help from people. I find nuts and holes in the backs of screen brackets and jam flags everywhere. And this year I went to our, I was chatting to our group COO. So we're a 25,000 person company, you know, chatting to the group COO. And I said, oh, he said, oh God, I love the flags. And I got one jammed in his screen as well. And, uh, you know, and I said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to take them down. And he was like, why are you taking them down? Why are you taking them down? So I had to leave them up for like through July as well. And we did. Um, and, and what that does is it gives him, it gives our most senior staff just this, this ability to say it. Because they're not going to naturally walk around the office floor and say, by the way, I'm really fine with people being gay. Because that's not natural, you know. And again, it comes back to how do I know? How do I know that if I experience homophobia in my team or from my boss, how do I know that I will be supported if I take that to more senior levels of my organization? How do I know? Yeah. So, so for me, pride is, is, is another way that our allies can show their support and that our workforce and our community can feel happy and comfortable about being out. And, and you know, when you see that, we, we operate in jurisdictions where it isn't, you know, a, a comfortable thing to be. You know, I mean, we're in 70 countries. So what am I saying to those people who, as soon as they walk out of the office, there is real threat? What I'm saying to them is, the other side of that door, you're fine. You're supported. You're safe to be you. Because every time I have a meeting, there's a rainbow flag somewhere around me that they can see that that support is there. So that's what pride is for me. The march and everything else is great. Love it. You know, it's brilliant fun. And I completely echo what Antonio says about corporates in it. And I know we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but that's, that's for me, that's what it is. It, it's it's here's, here's where you can show your support and show everybody that, you know, it's it's cool to be you here and i think arlene what, what you've said really is that you know uh, you know you're, you're 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 in london you're based in london but that for global colleagues of your company that it's a way to make them feel comfortable in the organization even if the norms in their society does not yet allow for that but but that but that presupposes london's okay too it's not yes it's not yeah. yeah so i'm not i'm not running a pride network for my colleagues in sri lanka or india i'm running it for colleagues who in London, haven't yet come out because they don't know if it's safe. So let's get, get rid of this idea that London is this brilliant cosmopolitan place. I live in a tiny village in Buckinghamshire. I never have any homophobic experiences. Yeah, I do here in London, absolutely. And I'm sure many of us will echo that, you know? Thank you. Belton, consultancy. If we think about the positive change, either within your own company or in, in general, where has it come from? Well, well, I guess I'm going to speak. I'm going to take it back a little bit because I think when I when I grew up, I almost didn't feel it was okay to be myself. And I still remember being, I think, 12 years old and seeing um, all of these gay and lesbian people on TV dancing around. And it turned out that that was Sydney Pride. And I remember saying, "I want to go there. Look at those people. They're like me." And and that kind of visual representation, that celebration, almost told me it was okay. And so I think pride has always represented that it is okay. And when I looked at the history of kind of moving to the UK and hearing about um, Section 28, I think it was called, um, where it was, we don't want to teach this in schools. We don't, we don't want that to, to, to be what our children learn about. It's almost taking those steps back. And then you had pride, which started to normalize that again to so many people who didn't believe it, who didn't feel it 
Pride is almost in your face. It's talked about on the news. It's talked about everywhere. And what you started to see was corporates, most corporates all started to have LGBT networks within their organization. And when I worked with Pride in the City, I think one of the most rewarding things was to see different organizations start to create those networks because it's not like they had more gay people <laughs> after the network was created. They just had more people feeling that they could be out in the organization that they, they were out in. And it, it was a signal to those organ to the managers and to the leaders of that organization to say, we are an organization that supports people being themselves and we want people to feel comfortable being themselves. And I, and I think working in the, the professional services industry, we're almost, I, I feel like we're always at that forefront with kind of the financial services or industry. I feel like they're the industries that are always kind of leading the way um, when it comes to kind of corporate change and policy. And, and I just feel like it, re it really helps to um, create that visible representation, validating that it's okay to be who you are. And, and I think Arlene, you, you said it great, that visible representation really um, means so much to, to so many people. So if, if you if you take the kind of the, the affinity group that's within your own company or within, within, within in other companies, the visibility to other um, employees, that, that makes sense. And then if we think about the role that they have in the organization liaising with top management, can you say something about that to, to create change? And, and can you repeat the question? So if I think about the affinity group that, that you're involved with in Pativity, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. is your role with respect to talking to top management about change that you might want within the organization? Got it. Well, I think one of the one of the beautiful things for me is I created the network when when I created the network of productivity. I, we we did it because I wanted people to just kind of feel comfortable being themselves, and that was the originating kind of factor. And then I remember I went one day to um, the office during Pride Week. We had rainbows everywhere, and when we left the office, I took my rainbow off, put it in my pocket, and went to the pub with friends. And my colleague kept his his on, and I remember saying, "Oh, but people might think you're you're gay," and he's like. Well, I don't care. I'm an ally. And I remember taking mine out and putting it back on. And I realized that it wasn't just about um, creating a safe space. It was really actually about driving change. So what I think organizations and these networks allow us to do is allow us to have a safe space to start having those conversations with the executive management team. You are able to, I guess, bring a, a diverse set of people. And it helps to, to have those kind of conversations around do we think we should be creating metrics to track LGBT within the organization? Do we think we should have a policy that supports transitioning for, for individuals? Do we think we need to have a, uh, a gender neutral adoption policy? There's lots of little things that you may not know, um, but I feel like networks are allowing us to have those conversations more and more. Fantastic, thank you. And um, Pips, so our um, the inclusion initiative at the LSC works with financial professional services where you are at the moment in, in Credit Suisse. So I'm wondering, specific to your sector, what has brought about positive change? That's a really good question. I'm humbled to be here and it's really hard to follow so many amazing other responses. I think certainly within the financial market services and you know where I'm positioned, I think from us, Pride is really about galvanizing and highlighting, you know, the, the amazing work that's been done, but for the entire year, you know, looking at how much progress has been made. And it's very much not just during June and July. It's, you know, it's really shining visibility onto how much progress has been made. What are we doing? What changes are we driving? And using that focused time to really highlight the impact and progress that's being made. But I think it's a fusion. It's, it's looking at the good wins that have been made, but also reflecting on, you know, where have we come from? But also, what are the very real challenges that we are re really still facing? You know, LGBT hate crimes going up, and it's not all just glitter and rainbows. We also need to include an element of, you know, we've done well, we've made good wins, but there is still some real challenges that we need to work together to address. And I think it's really important to call out, you know, Pride, and this is financial markets as well as everywhere else. It's very important to make sure it's a every single month, every single day thing. You know, there are some firms that will do pink washing and they'll just rock up during Pride and then you don't hear about their LGBT inclusion for the rest of the year. You know, that is so not the ethos of what we believe in and what I think matters from Pride. And I think one other aspect that some of the other people have absolutely touched on, which is key, is it's such an important opportunity for LGBT allies to also show 
their solidarity and their allyship, right? You know, because yes, it's about the LGBT community, but it's also really about fostering allyship because I honestly think allyship and getting more people involved in the conversation is what's moved the, the dial so much more. And I think from a community perspective, you know, I know myself personally, I've always been out as non-binary and gender fluid to my family and friends since four or five years old, but it was a corporate workspace that was the hardest, biggest challenge. And it was only like seven years ago that I did come out, but it was having things like pride. It was having those communities. It was having those groups of people that were perhaps similar to you that were different, but were, that were living authentically that gives you the courage and the you know the ability to come out so i think it's so powerful i think jane and several others touched on this earlier the signposting and the visibility talking about be proud of who you are you know it's a really good catalyst to say to everybody authenticity matters so very much you know live your true authentic life it's important so i think it's twofold it's you know community it's really good for but also allies it's such an important point for allies to show their solidarity you said something at the beginning, Pips, about about hate crimes going up, and I saw those statistics recently. And I think, you know, some of the progress um, for other groups, where there are affinity groups and organisations where we have data, we can see it have been glacial, actually. And I wanted to kind of get your reflection on progress, perhaps, you know, during the COVID pandemic or even just before, whether your sense that progress has slowed. Do you think that it's it stopped? And given the kind of rise in hate crimes, do you think that we might be taking a step backwards? Um, I think certainly from my observations, and that's just in London and other countries that we work with around the world, I think it has definitely slipped back, sadly. You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why that is, but absolutely, you know, I personally noticed a difference, and I know a lot of other people, both within London and beyond, there's a lot of places where real steps have been taken backwards. And sadly, it takes the community so much time and effort to make good progress and take steps forwards, but it's so quick and easy for that to be stripped away, you know, whether it's due to administration changes or whatever. So I would say definitely the rhetoric has changed and I've definitely noticed a slight backward step in terms of, you know, how safe do you feel, you know, and even walking the streets in London, yeah, I think a lot of people have noticed a difference in terms of do you feel confident and safe to do so? You really have to think where you are, when you are. And it's sad to have to think like that, but you really do for your own safety. And that's even in this country. If you look at other places like Poland, et cetera, and Warsaw, it's even worse. So I would say, sadly, the statistics do reflect the sad reality and perception that we have perhaps taken a step backwards. If we take the, the comments, Jane, that have been made so far, two things have really stood out for me. So visibility um, and, and, and storytelling and, and, you know, signaling that, you know, maybe to younger people, to people who are struggling, that it's actually okay to be yourself. So kind of slap bang in the middle of that is the media. So the media has, you know, a huge platform to reach lots of different people with stories, with narratives, and they can, they can change cultures. And, I, and I'm wondering how you see the role of the media kind of looking backwards were there big moments that the media helped bring uh, progressive change or that they actually missed that they could have um, that they could have been telling stories when they weren't um gosh i mean yes of course i mean we can probably certainly those of us on this of, on this panel and we're all come maybe of a certain age and, and we can all think of the big moments that were hugely important hugely significant um you know brookside eastenders um and it's interesting in fact that the first two things that have just come into my head there are soaps and in fact soaps are the most fun can be can be the most fantastic driver of change can't they whether it's about issues around disability or i mean you can pick all sorts of topics they can be fantastically helpful um i i, I mean i have no background in drama um and I, I, you know, I can't pretend to speak for the for the drama department or the ent light entertainment department or anything like that. Um, but uh, but we're we're finally getting there with some things, aren't we? And so, for example, one thing that obviously pops into my head is is Strictly. And um, on the new season of Strictly, we've got the first uh, male pairing, haven't we? Um, and then last year in the last series. We had the first ever gay pairing, which was um, two women, brilliant. Uh, and that was, you know, the great Nicola Adams and her female partner. And again, because it's such a, a programme with such a high audience, millions and millions of people on a Saturday night, I think that is utterly fantastic because that if, if that doesn't normalise 
uh, same sex relationships, I don't know what does. I mean, I just think that is absolutely brilliant. And the, you, you, well, you probably, people watching this will remember the call was there for years and years and years for Strictly to have a same sex partnership. Uh, and, and we finally got there and hey, I'm, you know, better late than never. I just think it's it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but actually partly to, to Pips's point and, and some others and Arlene as well, pointing out that, you know, not everything's rosy in London, let alone getting outside of the capital. Um, and I and I I remember um, only a couple, few weeks ago when we were I was doing an interview on BBC News about the announcement of the first male pairing on Strictly, what I would consider a pretty lightweight, fun, uncontroversial topic. And I happened to be interviewing the TV critic Scott Bryan, who you might know. Um, he does a Five Live podcast, um, uh, current TV critic, and and Scott happens to be gay, and so he and I were chatting about the announcement of the new candidate on Strictly, um, and Scott was making all the points that you could imagine he would make, uh, frankly, just as a TV critic, aside from the fact that he happens to be gay himself, uh, about how great this was, Saturday night viewing, it's a family show, isn't it brilliant that families are going to sit around and see this, you know, things that most right thinking people would would not consider remotely controversial and then oh inevitably on twitter why do i even look at twitter sometimes you know um he and i had a had a joint tweet from a man who complained that our our interview was really offensive and um the bbc i wish the bbc would stop ramming all this lgbt stuff down our throats um, and you feel like, of course, I don't respond. I mean, in fact, actually, I don't respond on Twitter generally, actually, as, as a principle. But um, uh, I just thought, yeah, we do have the Equality Act in this country, sir. You know, uh, I mean, I didn't go there. It's not worth it. I never, ever get into Twitter spats ever. I just don't behave like that on Twitter. Life is too short. Um, but there you are. And I thought that was, you know, the day's frivolous, fun, light interview that I was doing when most of my time, as you can imagine, is spent discussing COVID and pressures on the NHS and all the rest of it. I thought, oh, three minutes where we can have a nice, lovely chat about Strictly. Uh, and, you know, let's never forget. And there was, OK, maybe I shouldn't even give that chap such prominence for his ridiculous tweet, because because obviously lots of tweets about it were very, very positive. Um, uh, and that's the nature of social media, sadly, isn't it? That you you don't remember the 99 lovely comments, you remember the one unpleasant one. But uh, but on a serious point, that reminds us, that reminds us of how we still have a ways to go. So uh, uh, th that's one of my classic long rambling answers, Grace, where, there, you know, I do think uh, all power to Strictly. I have no association with the programme. I don't know people who work on it, but I think what they've done is a, a fantastic thing for, for driving forward positive representation and, and that's what we should we should absolutely see more of right I, but I think the the loss of Russia that you raised where somebody can say something negative that can really get you get you down that's felt by everybody that you know that, yeah. that, that, that that's every every human being but I think the other person when, when I was thinking about the media I was thinking about the BBC but bringing up Twitter is really relevant because you know the Equality Act doesn't exist on Twitter because they haven't figured out how to kind of restrict people's movements so it's up to the companies themselves at times, which is quite problematic because a lot of the discourse that we get is negative, is probably on social media rather than on the mainstream, the mainstream news. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And if someone wants to sit down and take the time to write an old fashioned letter and make a formal complaint in the proper way and go through the proper processes, then that's fine because they've taken the time, they've considered their argument and that sort of, I'm not saying no one should ever complain, of course, and, and, and that should be considered, but, but as we know, I mean, God, God, let's not, not, let's not go down the social media rabbit hole because, because we all know that it's just too too easy now to to mouth off about what you feel and you know as we always say people say things that they almost certainly would not say if they were standing this close to me in the pub you know and and, and wanted to make that kind of comment they they just wouldn't we, we all know they can behave uh, on twitter in particular in a way that you would not face to face Kind of sticking with the the kind of controversial team, Arlene, I'm going to come to you. So kind of for the for the annual um, Pride, uh, Pride March was obviously cancelled this year. And I wanted to kind of get your reaction to the protest Pride, because you, you said that we we're going to come on to kind of the corporations uh, backing Pride, which happened at the end of July, where thousands of LGBT plus people took to the streets of London to protest against the perceived commercialization of the British um, official annual Pride March. So what, what were your thoughts on that? So... 
<clears throat> I I mean, look, I I have I have I think it's any anybody who walks down the street holding a rainbow flag, proclaiming that you know acceptance and equality for LGBTQ plus people in my book all day long, go for it, right? I'll never criticize any activity or action like that whatsoever. So so we've been talking a lot about you know the visibility the 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 kind of ways that these events create uh, a, a place where our allies and where we can say you know we're here this is good as a company we support this blah 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 and i you know i slightly just just backtrack slightly to what jay was saying about social media not going down the social media rabbit hole for for me social media is a, still feels like a very new thing I have a 12 year old daughter. It just feels like her normal thing. OK, and, and, and unfortunately, it is that that these pe- that, that that younger people are listening to. It is that is that is their YouTube is their TV, you know, and um, it, it's that's that's the, 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 the world within which they live. So when you're hearing that and then you're going through university and you're coming out the other side and going into into the workplace, I just come back again. How do I know if I'm okay, if I belong there, you know? So when you see things like, you know, the Barclays float or the Balfour BC float, as Antonio was saying, it's, it screams a lot of, there's a lot of messages just in that presence. There's lots of messages about acceptance. There's lots of messages about an organization that you think is full of you know, men with their jeans hanging down or whatever it is who would slag you off as a gay woman walking down the street in a heartbeat, actually, no. You know what? Even there, this is an organization of acceptance and inclusion. So that, I think, is really important. And it's really important for me that if anybody wants to come and work at LSEC, that they know through that kind of visibility that that's going to be a good thing. Then you look at the other side of this and where I think you know, Linda Riley and Peter Thatchell and, 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 and Lady Phil, all of whom I hugely respect and adore. Where were they coming from? They were coming from the point of um, pushing out the smaller organisations and the charities who are doing incredible work in the community. Um, people like the Albert Kennedy Trust, for example, who, again, huge fan of, you know, how do they create their presence when the amount of money it costs is a is is a chunk of money. Like to be in the in the, in the to be in the parade, I don't know what their pricing would be. I'm sure it's slightly different, but for them is a bed for an LGBTQ plus young person for a year, right? So 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 how do you how do you balance that? You know, and I know they get better rates, but you know it's a, still a chunk of money. So how do you how do you kind of balance that in your mind? And I and I and I so so do I agree that having astronomical pricing and I'm sure you can go and look it up and it is astronomical for corporates like you know like we're from yeah I do do I think it should be channeled into and we can afford it and therefore we should be pushing money yeah absolutely but we cannot price out the small organizations we just can't do it um, and then of course look there was a whole bunch of other things that were going on in Pride in London over the past 12 to 18 months that I'm sure we'll get on to and of course, that also had to be a, hang on a second, can we just remember, get back to basics, lots of controversy, lots of controversy about exclusion, you know, lots of problems that I know Pride and London are desperately trying to resolve. But, you know, you kind of go, that back to basics thing, I liked it. So I liked it as a theme, take a breath, let's remember why we're here. But it's a hard one, you know, it's a really, really hard one. It, it really is. It's, a, it, it's tough. But I... I certainly wouldn't want as corporate to be excluded from it because I think we have a lot to offer. We have a lot to bring to us. But um, like we were basically wearing AKT, we were going to wear AKT logos on our T-shirts, you know, to raise visibility of that. So, you know, there's other ways that we can we can kind of help this the, the problem a bit. Martin, do you have any reflections on what Arlene has said or, or, or kind of different reflections on the, on, on the changes to Pride? No, no, I think I think Arlene hit the nail on the head in, in, in many ways. I think um, pr- this year has been a very, 
I guess, interesting year with Pride. I think in May they put out their apology for the racism and bullying that had been experienced by some of the volunteers. Um, and that actually cost a lot of the board members to step down. And I think as a result of the board members stepping down, that, that opened the door to, uh, I guess, the community it represents to say, is pride still representative of what we had originally wanted it to be representative of? Now, I think as someone who has volunteered for pride in London for, for five years with kind of that pride in the city, um, I think what people sometimes forget is it's run by 150 volunteers. And so it's not a, a corporation that is a for-profit corporation where you can get people to do things. And as someone who did manage a team with, within Pride London, the hardest thing ever is to get anybody to do something when they're a volunteer, because you're essentially asking them to help, even though they're on your team, even though they said, I'm gonna, I, I promise to help, I promise to give my time. When they have their day job and they wanna go out on the weekends, like you, you, it, it feels like you're begging people to do things. And so when you're trying to, to make change happen and you're trying to plan these events of this scale and this size, the hardest thing to do is to get that right level of input from people to actually help drive that change. And, and I think what I really want more people to do is if there's a lot of strong, I guess, opinions on how pride should be changed, I would say go out and volunteer. Volunteer for Pride in London or volunteer for UK Black Pride, both amazing organizations, um, but volunteer because it's so easy to kind of criticize when you're from the outside. Yet when I was giving, I think four hours a week at, at times, that's, that's around 20 hours a month. That's a part-time job that you're giving on top of a 50 to 60 hour a week job you already have. Um, and so I think more people volunteering to really help drive that change would, would be useful. I think, I, I also think the protest pride that, that um, happened earlier this year was to also showcase that, look at what can be done without money look at what can be done without planning, without coordination with, with the, the, the city, because it costs so much money for security, for fencing, for things along those lines. Um, and the protest pride didn't. But I think what we also forget is what does Pride in London try to make sure it happens? It tries to make sure that it is televised so people who can't travel to it can still participate. It tries to make sure that there's interpreters. And so on every single stage, if, you, if you're hard of hearing, you can still participate in all of the festivities. And in recent years, they've created a community engagement group to try to better engage with communities. And so I think they're trying to now say, if we are partnering with these corporates who actually are from networks of LGBT people trying to do good things, then maybe we can try to use those funds that we're raising to try to drive and do more change. And so I think there's a lot of good intentions, um, but I think it, if the community, which I think it is, is now asking for a potential change of pace, I think the fact that we've canceled Pride for two years running is giving maybe Pride that, that time to take a step back and think. And I think the names that Arlene mentioned earlier with Peter Tatchell, Lady Phil, and again, all people who, who I do respect quite a bit as well, I, I think now that's creating a huge amount of dialogue. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see what comes from all of these changes next year and how Pride might look to reshape itself while still, I guess, maintaining its stage on the global presence of being one of the, the world's leading LGBT drivers for change, not just here in London, but, but globally. So we have a, a, a number of questions coming through. I'm gonna take one first from Kate. Um, so she's an incoming MSc student here at the LSC. Um, she's head of inclusion and wellbeing in financial services, and she's gay. And her question is, what are the unique challenges that face LGBT plus talent achieving career progression, um, moving on to leadership roles? Is it more than not feeling that, that these people cannot be their authentic selves? So is it more than not being able to, to be yourself? So I guess it's about are the barriers on the organizational side versus on the, on the individual side? Does anybody want to take that one? Pips, can I come to you? Absolutely, that's a, that's a really good question. I think, you know, we've touched on authenticity quite a bit already. Um, I think you cannot talk enough about that. You know, the, the impact of someone being able to be their true authentic self, whether it's a financial services or whatever, is absolutely massive. I think, you know, I think most of the people on this panel and <laughs> on the call as well, we know, you know, the impact of living behind a lie or a facade it has a huge impact on how you perform your commitment to the firm the relationships you build with people around you because i think when you are your authentic self 
you build a very different sincere relationship with those around you and people respect anyone even more so I think when they know that person has had the courage to perhaps come out and be slightly different and be authentic in their true self so I think definitely the power of authenticity I think you cannot empathy you know you cannot stress enough the importance of that and you know I lose track of the amount of younger children at school and unis as an example as well reaching out saying you know they are so glad and proud to see people in large corporate firms financial services or whatever actually embracing their authenticity because to them a lot of them are having to deal with so much crap whether it's at school or being bullied and for them to see that there's light at the end of the tunnel for them to see that firms are embracing authenticity and you know celebrating diversity not tolerating it that's a massive difference that means the world to them because I think when you look at the amount of children particularly attempting suicide because they feel they cannot be their true authentic self I think Stonewall figures 21,000 UK young adults every year attempt suicide that breaks my heart you know I've lost good dear friends because they felt they'd never be accepted so I think that the cost of not being able to be your true authentic self you really cannot put a price on that so I think the more firms do to ensure that we do celebrate it everyone's included the point made earlier about people going back into the closet when they started a large corporate or whatever we need to get rid of that so I think definitely authenticity is such an important key thing uh, I may have gone off topic slightly there Grace hopefully well, not it, but um it, it, it's absolutely spot on and I was telling you there's kind of two parts to the question so one leads me to one that I was going to ask Belton there's an individual who feels that they cannot be themselves at work and then there's the kind of barriers that are at the organizational level and Belton we have we have some data but quite little data um, to kind of talk about how how progress is measured. So can you, can you comment on that, the data itself and the type of data that you might like to see collected? Yeah, so I think, I think there's no current, I guess, best practice of data that should be collected. I think if an organization is looking to say, what can we do to better drive change with an organization? I think a good starting point is the Stonewall Equality Index. It's a free thing that you can be a part of. And um, they help you to assess your organization and where they're at, I guess, in terms of diversity. Um, I also know that the FCA, the PRA and the Bank of England right now have a consultation paper where they're looking at um, trying to create industry standards, potentially, that they can push out to the financial services organizations that can be done consistently. Because as of right now, one organization might not track it, another organization might track it. And because of that inconsistency, it doesn't allow for that transparency that I think so many people want. Um, I think on the other side of it, once organizations start tracking, once you start tracking, that's what you can start making um, real change happen. Um, I don't know any project that's being run without having a monthly touch point on some of the key metrics, including the finance and the budget. Um, and if we are, as organizations talk about really believing in diversity, yet we don't have any metrics that we're tracking it, I don't believe you're really believing in diversity. I think metrics are core to um, really helping to, to drive that change, especially around categories that have to be self-reported, such as sexual orientation and or disability. These are things that we can't just see and make change. We actually have to ask people um, when it, when it comes, comes to that. So I saw Jane, Jane raise her hand at that point. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you on all of that, Belton. I just think um, what's interesting, and of course, now I'm going to throw a curveball in as well, is you absolutely have to measure it and you should. And, and yeah, spot on. Um, but one thing I know we have discovered where I am is that um, if, if you look at, uh, we have an internal staff survey, I guess other sectors do similarly. And uh, when we looked at the last um, load of stats that came out of that and people who um, were happy to tick a box to say that they were perhaps not heterosexual, whatever whatever variant on that they might, they might be. Um, those stats were produced as percentage of LGBT staff, or uh, forgive me, I, I think, I think I'm right in saying, forgive me, I think it was probably percentage of LGB staff very specifically uh, to make my, my point here because it was LGB generally, but that doesn't tell us, does it, about that age old classic, the breakdown between gay men and gay women or by, by men and by women. And uh, so there we go. I'm just going to throw another another bomb in the, in, the, in the water there, because that is the age old problem that I always get asked about when I do talks or chair internal events at the BBC is why are there nowhere near as many uh, out authentic 
gay women or bi women as men and no disrespect to all the lovely men watching this and the lovely men on the panel but um it's just why why do we still have this problem between men and women and why i don't know i i, I don't know I, my god if i had a fiver for every time i've been asked the question about um why how can we encourage more women to come to our lgbt groups jane and i was like, i don't know i don't know what the difference is there but i know internally um absolutely um look at the measure the data to belton's point but i think personally i think we need to be me uh, measuring men and women within that lgb group as well uh, mm. because we have um, a reasonable number of uh, gay men in, in our organisation in terms of percentage of overall staff, but a pretty poor number of gay women. Um, so you've got to be specific with your, with, with your measuring. But as to why that's the case, oh my God, I wish I knew. <laughs> anyway, Can so I, I raise that question? curveball in there. Yes, Arlene. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I mean, Jane, it's, a, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I, what, you know, and I, I experienced the same thing. Far more out gay by men than there are out gay by women, but but you know, and 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 the the you know what does it mean when I disclose? What does it mean when I disclose that information? Right, women are already at a at a have they're already on the back foot, right? They're already perceiving themselves to be disadvantaged in the workplace. Okay, gender pay gap, blah blah blah, lots of news, lots of stuff talking about that. So I'm already so as a woman, I'm already in a place of potentially difficulty in the career ladder, right? As a man, I probably don't feel that. Now, whether this is right or wrong, I'm talking about kind of how do I feel as a woman coming into the workplace? Now I add on that I'm gay, right? Then I am I feel like I couldn't be on double whammy back foot, you know? You know, add on that then you're a person of color. Add on then that, you know, you're Irish or you're, you know, and you add all of that on. And you go, well, how is my career going to progress when actually I've now what I've in my mind, I've got all of these barriers that I've got to get through. I've got to work so much harder or do I? So is it just easier that I just hide one of those because I don't have to tell you? Right. You know, it just it takes away one of those barriers to me being able to go. But then what it does is, is as Pip says, is now I'm not being authentic. Now I'm I'm although I'm a person of integrity, I'm not building in relationships based on integrity because I'm having to fight this now. So there's in a whole other area that your career gets disadvantaged in. So it's really tough, you know, it's 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 a tough one. And and I suppose what I always want to say is none of it's true, you know, none of it's true. Women are getting better, you know, career options and and, and opportunities in the workplace. I'm a gay woman, I'm senior in my company. Never an issue. We have a lesbian CEO of LSE, you know, so we're getting there. Anyway, I just wanted to add that in that, you know, do, it's almost like a, could you blame them? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> But, but I, I guess in, in some ways, Arlene, what you're, what you're talking about as well is a difference between kind of compliance, which would be auditing data and looking to see whether there are differences across groups and intersectionalities and culture change which can be brought about to a certain point by the auditing and paying attention to particular groups, but ultimately needs something like the prize movement to actually change minds and hearts. Exactly. So we have a, a question from Anna from the audience who's asking, what is the biggest obstacle, most difficult conversation you encountered as you were trying to progress your career and your life? Um, she's very impressed where everyone is now, but she's interested in the least enjoyable part of your journey related to who you are today. Very personal question, Anna. Anybody willing willing to take it? Antonia? I think you are mute. Um, I will take it because um, I, I, I led a double life for five years before I transitioned. And that double life was secret from everyone, um, all my family, uh, all my workplace uh, colleagues. Um, but it was a nocturnal second life. And, um, uh, and after those five years, I found it very draining trying to lead these two lives. So I decided to transition. And um, the, the difficult questions were, how do I tell my family? And how do I tell my workplace? And sort of telling my family, I sort of knew was not going to be welcomed. 
and it was going to be a long journey to to hopefully keep them on side with me. But telling my workplace was the immediate um, curtailment of my income. It was everything falling apart if they didn't want me to stay. Now I was a, um, and I, I think we'll probably come on to it into the other question. But I, I was a late transitioner. I transi transitioned in my forties, early forties. And I was at a relatively senior position. I was one of six equity partners in a West End practice based in St. James's Mayfair. And I had, I had come up from the, the, the ground roots. I joined them as, a, as a, um, uh, a trainee and I had trained with them and got qualified and been promoted uh, through the partnership ranks. So going to them and telling them that I wasn't the man they had known and I wanted to change and I was going to change and become the woman I know I am. Um, in that environment, back in, in, in just in 2000, the turn of the, uh, turn of the millennium, um, and knowing them as well as I knew them, I'd sat around the board table and heard them say, there'll never be a female partner in this practice. This is an all male affair. I'd heard them tell the jokes about the, uh, the female secretaries and, you know, as cringeworthy as they were, I had to just sit there and, and, and hear them. So I just thought, how do I tell them? And for me, that was the most difficult conversation, going to them and saying that I'm basically making myself redundant or, or I'm, I'm going to get thrown out. I mean, as it turned out, they didn't throw me out um, or they didn't ask me to leave me to go. But um, that was a, a fairly um, unique uh, situation to face. Yeah. What, what you describe, Antonia, uh, kind of having to hide who you were for a number of years, I, it almost feels like people need to build up kind of mental muscles in order to hide part of themselves um, away from their colleagues, away from their family. Do you think that causes productivity loss for companies? Because we know what it does to the individual. I, I mean, both physically and mentally, of course it does. And in my case, um, I, I don't know how I did what I did. I, I was I was leading a very full nighttime life as Antonia, um, and uh, but it was part of my learning experience. It was is part of, of understanding who I who I was and being able to to um, assimilate it and 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 decide. You know, am I going to am am I going to keep that side of me buried all my life and take it to the grave, or am I going to you know? be able to say to myself no I'm, I'm going to be authentic I'm going to be the true person I am but but for those five years yes I mean it was draining it was exhausting um, I was probably surviving on a few hours of sleep <laughs> through the weekday nights now was that affecting my work um, I don't think it was I was running on adrenaline because that those those hours that I was Antonia nocturnally was was firing me um, I was able to be someone who I never thought I was going to be so actually it, it was energy for me um, uh, but 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 I think that, you know the, after five years of doing it I realized I couldn't carry on like that I couldn't lead the entire my entire life that way so I had to change and the, the change was I had to say to myself mentally am I going to put Antonia back in the box and shut her away and be Anthony um, and accept accept my my fate, or or am I going to change things? And I decided to change things, but but in doing that, obviously, the um, the big questions were then dealing with the family and dealing with work. As it turned out, I'm 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 still with my family, and they're all part of my life. And and my work colleagues did accept me, although ironically, their response to the problem was, uh, "You make too much money to tell you to go." So it was pure commercial necessity. That they put up with what I was doing. Oh wow! So you think you think that if if you were replaceable, they would have replaced you? If I was, yeah, absolutely. And if I was younger, they would never have had. They would never have given that option. I, I wouldn't have been making the money I was making. I wouldn't have had the client contacts, and I wouldn't have been involved in the projects I was involved in as as a more junior member of staff. It was because I was senior and. Was one of the, I was one of the big fee earners and I had the big client contacts that, that the firm fed, fed from. So, so yes, yeah, so that, that was the reason they didn't tell me to go, yeah. So there's, there's a statistic in McKinsey, Antonia, that says 80% of senior executives um, are out versus 32% of junior staff. And you said that you were a, a late transitioner in your, in your 40s. And do you think that you can kind of identify with waiting until you're you're more mature, more set in yourself to have those conversations, because that, that statistic really that, that statistic really startled me. Thirty-two percent 
junior staff, the younger generation today versus 80% senior executives? I, I, absolutely. And, and um, I, I get to talk to a lot of young um, teenage uh, trans uh, people. And it's clear that the biggest uh, worry they have, you know, they're not they're not concerned about the family. They're not anyway, they're, all those concerns are secondary to the big concern, which is will they get a job? Will there be an employer out there who wants to employ them? And, you know, and over the, the last few years, I've sort of seen that the concern behind that question drop that, that you know, I think there's, you know, we have more acceptance now. But, but for, for me, um, it, it, it's clear, had I, had I been younger, when I asked that question of my partners, um, starting out in my career or, or just been more of a junior member of staff, uh, I, they, they would have not made me comfortable. Um, they, they put up with me. I mean, ironically, you know, it, for five years, um, I stayed five years there uh, working as Antonia. I relished every moment being the authentic me. And I think what they saw is that they actually saw um, business as usual. It didn't, you know, I, I hadn't changed. I was still doing the business as it needed to be done, but I was a happier, I was a calmer. Um, I was um, someone who was enjoying life and they could see that. And ironically, uh, after five years, they came to me and said, would I like to be the next senior partner of the practice? which was an absolute gobsmack situation for me because that's the last thing I thought they would ever do. Um, but, but ironically, I thought, I thought really hard about that. And I actually said, no, I said no, because I'm leaving. And I left them and I left them because I wanted to start up my own practice. It was because I was emboldened through, through those five years of being, being able to be my authentic self. I was learning much more about myself and I was becoming more ambitious and and my authenticity was was growing and it, it, it just emboldened me. So I, I went off and set up my own practice. And uh, but and, and in doing so, it was highly motivational because at the old firm, um, 18 members of staff came to me and said, can we come with you? And so I took 18 members of staff from the firm as I left. That, that tells you about the culture that you were creating, that they wanted that they wanted to go with you. Yeah. Um, Pips, we, I plan to ask you about narrative and the power of narrative. So, you know, as a behavioral scientist, one thing that startles me because I started my career as an econometrician is that narrative always trumps data. So people will change their minds much more often when confronted with a story. Um, you know, they'll, they, they'll manage to feel themselves much more often when they're confronted with a story rather than data. Um, do you want to talk to, talk, talk to that point? Uh, yeah, I, I think both are really, 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 really important. I think, you know, personal stories are such a powerful, important way to sort of get across to other people through your own lived experience, you know, what you've had to deal with, and in doing so, getting them to better step up as an ally. So I think the whole sort of narrative and personal lived experience is so key. And I think, you know, for example, we've got reverse mentoring. I've got our EMEA CEO as my mentee, and that's a really good way to get very senior people in the firm. You know, we've got 65,000 staff on board through lived experience narrative as to the importance of allyship and LGBTQI programs and all of that stuff. But I think data is also incredibly important. I think, you know, I always go back to the point of, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. So I think, you know, narrative is all about lived experience and representation, and we, we need representation to be able to have that narrative. So I think having an insight into how diverse are your staff, how many, you know, gender identity, sexuality, ethnicity, whatever. It's so important to have that. I know certainly Credit Suisse, you know, we ask all of our staff in regions where, where we're allowed to, to give us their gender identity and sexuality and all that stuff, because it gives us such a good insight, because you can then start looking at where do you have the biggest challenges? Is it your recruitment? Is it your pipeline? Is it your promotion? Is it all of that important stuff? So I think you really, really need the data so that you can then start looking at where do you need to start addressing to do better? And obviously then we can then start talking about targets. And I know targets are not a silver bullet, but equally they drive behavioral change. They make people start focusing on a given challenge. And I've seen that time and time again. I mean, to, your, to you, Jane, BBC, I know you have targets across gender identity, sexuality, and all different dimensions. I think that's applaudable because it's really driving focus on 
let's sort the problems out. Let's get even better representation. So I think once you have the data, you can work out where you are or what you need to fix. You then get better levels of representation. And from that, you can then get the narrative and start talking about lived experiences. And I think the big thing with that is it really gets allies on board. It really gets them to understand the difference that they as allies make in terms of building that inclusive culture. So I think, as we've said on, on this session, it's really important, you know, the best way to fix this is to get people on board and start improving the culture so people feel included and that they belong, because only then will they actually be authentic. So if I take a question on allies to tag on to what you've just said, Pips, because you've talked about reverse mentoring the CEO and, and the importance of allies to create change. If somebody is listening who wants to be a better ally, what would what would you ask them to do? Um, asking that question is such a good step to start with. I think, you know, be curious and be compassionate. Learn about the network, learn about the lived experiences of the different queer individuals. And by getting that insight, you know, they are going to feel much more empowered about how they can best help out. They, you know, create the safe space so you can have the conversations, understand the identities, and in doing so, understand the challenges those groups are facing and how you can help make such a big difference. So I would say literally step up, get involved in the network. You know, allyship is a journey. You start with not really understanding the community and the challenges. You move on to then understanding it. You then move on to advocacy and being a much more visible vocal ally. So all of those things are so important. But the first step is getting involved in the network, understanding the community, and from that understanding how you can help by making such a difference. Because honestly, allies were the biggest difference for me personally. You know, it was only through them and the allyship that allowed me to feel safe to come out. So to me, that's a transformational shift. And, you know, to Antonia's point, slightly different. I only felt comfortable coming out because allyship and knowing that those allies are around there to support you. Five, ten years back, I didn't feel that society was ready to understand different gender identities, whereas allies coming along transforms that. And were those allies in your in your workplace or were they were, were you their friends outside your workplace? Um, both, both, to be honest. And, you know, it was such a scary thing, but I was blown away by how sincere and empathetic and touch. And, you know, people reaching out saying they're so proud of someone, to, you know, because I, I would never have felt safe coming out. You know, people just do not understand the different trans identities. I don't know how I'm going to express until I wake up on a given day. And people just couldn't get their head around that. So allies understanding the identities and what the differences are make such a difference and it you know honestly they save lives i say every ally is a superhero quite often they don't know the impact that they are having but they really do save lives belton if, if we stick with allies is there any other advice that you might give to people who want to be better allies who are listening yeah yes i think the the first is to understand that every single person is an ally and that means we can be an ally to a different group or sector um, and I think the important thing is, for example, I think the trans community right now needs the LGBT's support in everything that we do um, to make sure that, especially when it comes to children and in schools and things along those lines. So what can we do as a community to make sure we're always raising a profile? If you hear something, say something and actually being that supporter of that. But, but it's not just the trans community, it's, it's any marginalized or underrepresented group. And so when the progress flag came and it had the black and brown stripe, it created this dialogue. And as with coming out to your parents or, or having, having a conversation with someone, it's always a journey before people kind of get on the bandwagon, so to speak. Because when it first came out, everyone's like, why are we doing that? This is about gay people. This is not about race. And then I think you started to realize that by having the progress flag, you're actually opening the doors to say, guess what, we want to be supportive of racial inclusion in our community, but also we want to, to showcase that there, there, that systemic, systemic racism still exists. Mm -hmm. And the LGBT community wants to do more than just talk about it. They wanna be a part of that movement. Um, and if you've seen the movie Pride, highly recommend it, where the coal miners uh, are, are marching with, you know, the, the Pride, in, Pride in London parade, I, I think, being an ally is recognizing who is that marginalized group, what is that underrepresented group, and then trying to have a voice for them because that is how we we really drive change. And to, to Pips's point, the sea of allies are what drives change. Racism in America was stopped when 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 the white people were like, let's join forces and to help end racism, you know. And so we need to make sure that the the majority helps to help the minority. And that's really what allyship is. It's the people in the majority saying, I'm not just going to attend this. I'm not just going to listen to this. I'm going to be a part of the proactive change. 
And, and I think the importance of allyship and advocacy, if, if we think about the role of an advocate, it is often to point towards an injustice and highlight that it's actually, that it's there. And the more people who are saying it, the more likely it is, it is to get heard. Arlene, you have you have a really tough question that's being directed to you. So let, let, let me. So this is um, I'm from Robert. I love the way that Arlene has garnered the support of senior executives, as change can only happen when they are truly engaged. But I feel that there is a lot of lip service within organisations to ensure that they are seen to be doing the right thing. So I guess virtue signalling instead of actually doing the right thing. Looking at a wider inclusive perspective, how can we ensure that this approach is standardised so it becomes the norm across all organisations? I, I had read that, and thanks for the question. Um, I, I'm not sure that I understood the, the point about standardised, but so what do I think about people giving lip service? Um, you know, it's it's a voice, right? I, I don't really, I, I'll be honest, I don't really care. You know, if somebody is saying something positive from a senior pulpit in an organisation, great. I hope they believe what they're saying. I know my senior execs do, 100%. You know, we had a great event with Belton and Pride uh, in the city back in before COVID, just before COVID. We just, we just got in there, didn't we, Belton? You know, most of the senior executives were on the balcony. We did a market close ceremony and, and Pips was there. And, you know, it was just extraordinary. And they did truly, they do truly stand behind it. So how do I know? Well, okay, so somebody gives lip service because, you know, in a public forum or, you know, in an employee forum or whatever. But the real work begins when we start to, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not one for only doing this, but the real work begins when you start to support proper policy change, when you start to support benefits change to support people who are maybe on a transition journey, who are dealing with, you know, same-sex adoption. That's when the rubber really hits the road in an organization. So if I go to somebody, you know, ahead of, you know, something or other in my organization and say, okay, so what, you know, what about this? This is, this is where we now need to push and do the hard yards. Are you going to support me now? Are you going to support me when I pose to you and present to you the tougher problems? Um, that's when you know. Uh, and I, I personally have always been supported in, in pushing those things. I've got a pretty tricky conversation coming up soon, uh, completely with the backing of my organization. I'm not gonna, I can't talk about it, but it's a, it's a, it's a great, great thing. And I'm really proud that, you know, that we're, we're there. So I hope that's answered the question. Um, it, it, it has, but it's interesting. So I just scrolled down the question. So three people have asked questions about virtue signaling and, and washing. So I'm wondering if there's anyone else in the panel wants to add to what Arlene has said. So. Is there a value, even if somebody is paying lip service and virtue signaling, or do you think that it delays progress? I, I will chime in and just talk a little bit about um, when organizations are selling merchandise and profiting from it, especially when it's pride related merchandise. I think that is one of the um, absolute no-nos because I think that takes away from all the LGBT groups that are out there trying to actually drive real change. And so when you are purchasing, you know, LGBT stuff, don't buy it from Primark, buy it from like the Pride in London shop or uh, many charities that have tons of ways of trying to support the community. Um, and I know that's not directly related, but I do think that is something that's worth mentioning while we have an audience. And it's interesting. So, and I think the conversation around data here is really important as well. So if you combine data and measuring with somebody who is you know virtue signaling and giving lip service you can see if the data is moving so if the data is moving in a, in a progressive direction then maybe it has positive change if, if if it's not then questions then questions can be asked um so i have a a question about advice so if you can imagine somebody in the lgbt plus community who is experiencing exclusion in their organization and you can imagine being their mentee what advice would you give them um pips can i come to you I'm sorry, I was just removing the mute. Absolutely. Um, I think what could they do? Several things. I mean, one, reach out to people around them, whether it's the network, the community, internal, external people, and try and feed and take energy from what's being done outside and bring that in and try and help use that to address, I guess, the exclusion that you might be facing. It's really important to call in any microaggressions. It's really important to call in any exclusion like that. And when I say call in, it's about 
talk to those people that are making you feel that way and say, you know, do you realize what you're saying? Do you realize how you're making me feel? And get them involved in the conversation. Because I think those courageous conversations like that quite often will really get across to those people that might be exhibiting certain behavior quite often will help them comprehend and really empathize as to the impact of their words and how they're acting and how they need to really better step up. And I think I've also seen it slightly different, but often, particularly middle management and senior management, they want to do the right thing. They want to make things better, but they just need guidance as to what do they need to do. So I think, quite, you know, it's really important to give people the advice so they are then empowered to step up as an even better ally. But I think in that, that particular case, call that call that behavior in you know start talking trying to improve things try and get them involved in the conversation and ideally just address that exclusionary sort of what's happening because that's not right that's not proper and <laughs> there's a lot of ways it can be addressed but um just realize you're not alone be proud of who you are don't let that type of thing knock you back and that's always my advice to my younger self be so proud and be so loud of being different it's fine it's a good thing celebrate it and don't let other people or their judgment knock you back so your starting point pips is to kind of assume good intent but definitely question the behavior yes and you know even sometimes when it's not good intent every discussion you have you know every person you speak to that might be a bigot or whatever sometimes you'll plant a seed of thought in their mind that might make them think differently in the future so i, I even see those bad examples as a, an opportunity or a challenge and, you know, you'll always change someone's opinion in one way or the other. So, yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Jane, can you imagine yourself being a mentee to somebody who's feeling excluded at work? What would you advise them to do? Oh, gosh. Well, I really hope I could be. I mean, I, I do. I, I agree with what Pip says and I and I echo that. I wonder. Um, I feel as if I'm the one kind of always bringing the... <laughs> bringing the downer into this spot spot the cynical journalist on the panel I mean I was listening to Pip thinking of course you're right spot on and certainly that thing of planting a seed I think I think you're right there but if you're a fairly junior member of staff um, or quite new to the organization or new to the department or whatever I do think it can be really tough sometimes to, to because what you're describing there is someone who is innately quite self-confident or you know frankly has the balls to and, and and to just to just call out that microaggression and that that's can be quite brave in itself I mean I would certainly say go and talk to your organization's um LGBT group or your women's group or whichever whichever you know um group group of, that you feel is 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 right for you and then might be able to provide you from, from some support and, and if your company doesn't have um one of those staff networks then perhaps you're actually working for the wrong company because that's an issue in itself um uh, and I certainly hope I would be a mentee and and I would I always say I mean I, I chair quite a lot of internal BBC events especially anything that's related to diversity and inclusion I always I, I frequently get asked to chair and host those sorts of things and I love doing them and I really really believe they're very important to do but by the same token I stand up and it's sort of become a little bit of a running joke that I stand up at the start of them and go sorry folks you got me again because because there's no other lesbians to ask so it's that'll be me again you know and <laughs> and it's a little bit like that uh, Sue Perkins diary is very very busy so it's me and and I, I make a joke of it and, and and now at my ripe old age, I can approach these things with a sense of humor. But but there's a reason I really, really struggled to come out in my 30s now. And that don't get me wrong, that was not just because of my employer, not not by a long way. And I do not want to give that impression. You know, it's for lots of reasons. And as we all know, the struggling to come out is always for a whole host of reasons. Um, but um you equally we are here talking about making inclusive workplaces, and and I, I want my employer to be. Uh, outward looking and encouraging diversity and encouraging difference that's what we're talking about isn't it encouraging difference and I did um, a small in uh, I, I did an internal event uh, it was something during Covid it was a sort of staff phone-in thing and uh, in fact it was um, going back to what we were saying earlier about data collection it was in the run-up to the annual staff survey and they wanted someone to come along and sort of uh, they wanted a member of staff to sort of make a pitch as to why you should be honest in the staff survey essentially um it wasn't framed in quite that way but that's what we were talking about about please please if you are from any kind of minority if you have 
any disability or any any minority issue at all that you we really really want you to be honest in the staff survey because we want to build a genuine representative data set as to what our staff makeup is like and i really believe that and ties in with what we were saying earlier i mean i think you absolutely should be honest because because the, the corporation whatever company needs to needs to know where it's at um and so i did a little feel about why I felt it was important and why I would be filling in the staff survey, you know, very proudly ticking the box a lesbian and why I thought that was absolutely vital. And what was really lovely, lovely and touching, but also quite striking was this, this item that I did that that staff were watching was literally a couple of, I spoke for a couple of minutes, three minutes or something at the most. And afterwards I got a slew of emails from staff from all different parts of the BBC. Obviously, I purely work in news, but they I got emails from all over the corporation, um, men and women, but more women. Um, I mean, it's the kind of stuff that just makes me well up, really. Really, really lovely emails from people saying, oh, my God, thank you for saying what you said. Thank you for being so authentic. Thank you for being honest. And along with that, I got... Um, I mean, I don't tell this story wanting to be self-aggrandizing at all, but I thought it was really striking that I also got emails from people saying, oh, I have I have sort of wondered whether I'm in the right place. And, you know, I don't again, especially from women, um, you know, I really don't see a lot of gay or bi women where I work. And so I'm not really sure whether I'm working in the right place. And can I chat to you about that? And that was so lovely. And I was really touched that people felt they could email me. And I always feel people can. And I always, always stress that. Um, and, um, and so I suppose if you're that younger person who is feeling out of sorts and perhaps isn't quite as self-confident as Pips is or isn't sort of perhaps hasn't got the the, the get up and go that, that Pips is describing um uh you know maybe if you can just find that one person in your organization that you know and it, it might be you might be gay and you might be looking up to a straight person I mean you know, it doesn't have to you don't have to pick the only other lesbian in the newsroom you know you can you can email anyone who you feel might be supportive of you who might be an ally and just say you know have you got time for a, a phone call a cup of tea and just just, just try and get support that way because I was I was so 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 touched and, and everyone says oh I'm sorry to take up your time with this email and I never feel like that I never feel like that because I was that kind of scared uncertain person once and um, I wished I 20 years ago had either been brave enough or felt that there was someone that I could email to talk about and that might have changed things for me quite dramatically um and if i can do that now for someone who's younger or is new to might not be young but might be brand new to the corporation or the department or whatever then i absolutely want to do that so that would be my thing is reach out to the staff network but also if you know of a, an individual just be brave and, and send them a quick email I think what you say, Jane, really strikes a chord with the visibility that we started talking about of role models like everybody here on the panel, because without seeing you, people wouldn't know that they could actually reach out to you. Belton, I, I, I'm going to change the question slightly to make it even a little bit harder for you, because there might be somebody who is in an organization where there isn't a role model and it really is a toxic organization and, it, and it, 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 it's draining them down. And I always kind of think about the people who started to create the progress that we've actually seen today, even if we have to still have more change, that they were in that position at, you know, at one stage where they were in toxic environments and they stayed and they created the change. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, if you were advising somebody and they've come to you and said, my organization is really terrible, it's really wearing me down, would you, would you say you should go to another company, change the job, or would you say you should stay and fight the system? Uh, really interesting point, and I'll give you a plug here, because in the Think Big book that I read, which I highly recommend, it's really good. One of the things I loved about learning, which I actually speak about now quite a bit, is, is the locus of control. And it talks about where if you have an internal locus of control, you feel like you're, you are, um, if you have an external locus of control, you feel like there's external factors playing a role in your life. And if you have an internal locus of control, you feel like you're in charge of your life. And I feel like when that when I was at Pro Protivity and I'm like I want an LGBT network I went to create one and I feel like so many times if people are in a negative environment that imposter syndrome can get in their mind or if you're in a toxic environment you can feel like you're not good you're not worth it you're not driving change well I would say tell yourself you can do anything you want and you can look to try to drive that change and you can try to be the difference and if it's not working at that organization 
find an organization that does want you because there are so many out there that do. And I, I'm, I really don't honestly believe there are any organizations that choose to be, um, choose to be, I guess, discriminatory. I think there's organizations that don't get it yet. And if they don't get it, I think that's the opportunity for you to drive change. And so those toxic organizations aren't organizations saying, I only want to hire white men. There are organizations that say, all of the good people I've interviewed are white men, therefore it's just easy for me to say yes. That's really what they're at. And so if you're someone who says, here's how I can allow you to interview a diverse group of people in order to get the same results, I think people would be open to that. Thank you. Thank you, Belton. Arlene, being a mentor to somebody who's struggling at work, what's the advice that you would give to them? I couldn't get my mute button on, sorry. Um, I think, I mean, look, I think it's been said, you know, the 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 thing of, I, I agree, if you can be brave enough to have that conversation and call out and use it as a teaching tool, as we say, um, you know, that's that's obviously a really great thing to be able to do. But also I agree with Jane that, you know, it's not necessarily it's not everybody is going to feel that they can do that, you know, and, and, and so, you know, reaching out to people and supporting people. Um, I suppose I kind of would also just, I, I find it really important and interesting to know that that sort of thing is going on so that we can adjust our approaches to address it, you know? So, so what are, you know, I, I was in a, in a session recently and I, you know, quoted that stats that, um, you know, 62% of, of graduates are going back in the closet when they hit the workplace. And a comment was made, and it wasn't in any way meant in, in, in a, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't meant badly, was, well, that's probably because they don't want to show the wild side of themselves. And I was like, so what? Just because they're gay equals wild, you know? And, and it was interesting that that was, that was a perception. And it's good information, you know, it's good information because it means that we can now go, okay, maybe what we need to do is start to stand up the, here are the profiles of gay people. They are just like you, you know, some are wild, some are not, you know, it was just an interesting perspective. So, so what, what would I say? I'd say to somebody who came to me, all of the things that this panel has said, get support you will absolutely be supported. That's number one, you will be supported. Really, most importantly, don't worry that, you're, that this place isn't gonna have your back. We have your back, okay? If you can't have a conversation with that person, one of us will, all right? There will be a conversation, whether it's from you in, in conjunction with you or, or with you absent. It's gonna happen, you know? But most importantly, you know, for me is to say to somebody, if anybody was to exclude you or marginalize you because of fill in that blank, color, ethnicity, sexual orientation, blah, 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 that will not be tolerated. Equally, that's what we have to say out loud to the person who thinks it's okay to do that. It will not be tolerated. You will get into deep doo doo if you do this, you know? It won't be. And that's then when I get back to the policies and the rules and all of those things where we say, because we've written it here, you know, we are an equal opportunities employer. You go against that, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be trouble. So, so that, they're my kind of messages. And I've always said that to somebody who, who and, I, and people have come to me, you know, not, not in this organization necessarily, or they've come to me not really knowing if that's going to happen to them. My first message is your support. And I think you're, I mean, you're phrasing there, Arlene, if, if I came to see you and I was being excluded from work and you said that, I would feel immediately better. So if you said, look, they're not listening to you, but I am, you're, you're heard in this room, I honestly would feel immediate, immediately better. Um, Antonio, we're almost out of time. So your words are going to be the last, but definitely not the least. So what, what advice would you give to a mentee who came to you, who um, felt that they were being excluded in their, in their, by their employer? Uh I think I think everyone's contribution is 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 spot on. But I, but I suppose what I would do is just try to measure at, at what level is the exclusion. You know, at the extreme an extreme level of exclusion, 
I think there's no tolerance, as, as has been mentioned before. And, you know, I would, would like to think the person will be able to say, why am I being excluded or find that ally to help them expose the, uh, the exclusion and identify what it's about and give that part the person the chance to answer because if they don't come back with a fair and, and conclusive response then then you would move you would vote by your feet you would leave that person you you know you would ask for an alternative person to mentor you or you would consider that the business isn't a sound business to be in um, of course on the other hand there could be a level of subtle exclusion it's not it, you know and I think the important thing there to recognise is, is, is that some form of unconscious bias that's sitting in that person that's creating that environment. Because the, the, the important thing to do is that they need educating. You, you don't want them to continue being like that with the next person that they might be uh, mentoring. Um, so, and, and, you, and therefore you need to come at it as, a, as a, an, an issue where you're helping them to improve themselves and to be a better person. So. I, I think the ally, finding that ally, being able to contact someone. I've, I've had this before. People have contacted me um, when I sold the business. I was part of a thousand strong around the world. And I got a lot of emails from people in all sorts of jurisdictions about things. And, um, and I was surprised that they were making contact with me. It was because they'd just seen me on the business portal. They'd seen some of the things I'd written and said uh, in the press. And, and they were contacting me about what they were experiencing. And I was able to take it up the line. And, and some of it, it was, um, it, it was just badly, is the way they handled themselves and they didn't appreciate what they were doing and the environment they were creating. So I think there was a level to it. No, you, you just need to sort of capture it and analyze it um, to be fair to both sides. And I, I, I love how you framed that. So it, it kind of goes to how Pip started thinking, let's imagine that there's good intent and try to resolve it thinking that there's good intent. And then where we, we ended up when we talked to Arlene, if it gets really bad and it's exclusionary, there's zero tolerance. So thinking of that distribution, I think is, is really helpful. I just wanna take a moment just to thank everybody for um, coming and talking to me tonight for this 90 minutes and um, talking to the audience both here in Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, and kind of to, to thank you um, in the order that I can see you. Um, thanks Arlene, thanks Jane, thanks Pip, thanks Antonia, and thank you Belton for being an advisor to the Inclusion Initiative as well as being here and helping me organize the panel tonight. I, I've really learned a lot and I hope we can all keep in touch. Thank you all. See you soon.